Welcome to the first day of WordCamp. How cool is this? It is actually my first WordCamp this year, so I'm really excited to be here. It's Ahmed's fault that I'm here. He totally persuaded me to come and come and have a go. Um, and today I really want to talk to you guys about what WordPress in general and people who are designing sites and people who are creating products and, and anything to do with business really can learn from behavioral psychology because it's one of those things that's not particularly accessible. Um, it's kind of hidden away under lots of posturing and loads of jargon. And so I just want to make that a little bit more accessible for us so that we can make our consumers a little bit happier. So my name is Kenda McDonald. There is my Twitter handle. Should you have any photographs of cows on your phone, please tweet them to me. It makes me very happy seeing cows, especially in the morning, because I'm terrible in the morning. So you have any nice things, especially Highland cows. We're like in the right country for Highland cows. Those things are awesome, man. They look like shaggy, they look like the rock stars of cows. I love them. All right, so let's, let's dig straight in to the biggest problem that we're all facing as businesses. And being a business owner myself, this is something that we face too. And here's a little bit of audience participation. I know the British love this. I'm from South Africa, so I'm going to push you guys. Um, so what is it that consumers actually want? It's a bit of a hard question to answer, especially early in the morning. But come on, shout at me. It's your opportunity to shout. Oh, yes, that's a really good one. What else? What is it that consumers want? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> all of these things. Consumers really do want all of these things. They're great answers, by the way. Normally, they're not that intelligent. So I'm, I'm very pleased with you guys. You guys get an A plus already. But what consumers really, really want, aside from all of these amazing things, is to consume. We want to consume stuff, and we want to do it without any interruptions. We want to consume things, and we want to buy things, but we desperately do not want to be sold to. We want our value for money. We want people to make our lives easier, but we don't want you to sell to us. The second we sniff that you're selling to us, we're going to run in the other direction. And that's like makes it a little bit hard for businesses because what is it effectively that businesses want? We want to sell. <laughs> yeah. We want to sell stuff. And that leaves us with a bit of a problem. And the internet has kind of enabled this problem in a way because we have this divide between what consumers want to do on the one side here and what businesses need to do on the other side. And as the internet enables us, and as people become more comfortable doing things, the divide just goes this way. And we want to consume, and we want to do things, and we want to do it uninterrupted. We don't want, you know, like adverts in the middle of our TV programs. If we want to watch the next episode, we want to do it right now within three seconds. I think that's what Netflix gives you now, a whole four seconds to change your mind as to whether or not you want to watch the next episode. No whoops, you're watching the next episode, right? Um, and we as businesses are going, oh, all these people are hanging out over here, and I need to get my message in front of these people. I'm going to buy some advertising, and I'm going to shoehorn my way into their day. And so we're interrupting people. That ain't good, right? And we do it on our sites as well. You've got the person on your site, and what do we do? We throw up a pop-up, right? So now you're interrupting what they're doing right when they're doing it, even when you've got their attention. So that ain't good. Um, and the two words that prove this kind of thing are ad blockers. If ad blockers didn't exist, we could quite happily say, yeah, consumers don't mind being interrupted. If ad blockers didn't exist, we could say, yeah, consumers love advertising, it's fine. But ad blockers do exist, and consumers are getting much cleverer with the way that they kind of decide who they're going to consume with and who they're going to spend their precious attention on. So we've got to pander to consumers. And that makes things hard because consumers are, are fickle, and they'll jump around at the click of a finger, they'll go to another provider, and that makes our lives a little bit difficult. Um, and it, in the end, like it can seem like when you look at the stats, you're like, all right, I'm just going to go lie in a dark room and just cry quietly to myself, right? Because it just seems like you're doing this uphill battle all of the time. So are we doomed to fail as businesses? Well, maybe. It's, it's an entire, entire possibility. Um, there's some recent data from BuzzSumo on the decline of page views on WordPress. So at about May 2017, there was a peak of the amount of page views on WordPress. And after that, for the first time ever, page views have started going down, right? WordPress is just an easy platform to collate that data from because we have access to it. But this is probably a global phenomenon. So people are looking at less pages. Then we've got some really other interesting data. It's actually an increase in conversion rates globally. It doesn't matter. Oh, oh, I see. Oh. I'll just stay away from my slides then, shall I? <laughs> so 
there's actually an increase in, in global conversion rates, right? So it's now, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, there's a slight uptick in the amount of conversion rates. So it's very tempting to ignore the data and the decrease in page views because there's a big but in here. And the but in here is that in order to get that increase in conversion rates, you have to get people to spend 16% longer on your pages. So you've got to get people to spend 16% longer on your site to get the conversion rate and they're not looking at as many pages. So we have a little bit of a problem when it comes to how we address that with consumers and the data can be misleading, it can be very misleading. We can choose which bits of statistic we like to pay attention to and you know we can pretend, put the blanket over our head and pretend the monsters aren't actually under the bed. So we need to spend a little bit of time figuring out how do we get to the place that consumers want to be while still fulfilling our own business needs um, and we need to bridge that gap. And there are a couple of ways that we can spend, you know, spend time bridging that gap. Marketing automation is one of them. Marketing automation is an interesting thing, though. I really feel that marketing automation needs a real a new definition. So marketing automation as a term was coined like seven years ago, a little bit, a little bit longer back when marketing automation was sending email campaigns. Okay, that has nothing to do with WordPress at the end of the day. You can buy, it, buy a list, you can send emails to them. Yeah, we've got marketing automation. But let's look at the new definition of what marketing is. So we spread, split the two words out. We've got marketing and we've got automation. Marketing is now kind of slarketing, just like sales and marketing put together, because marketing has kind of absorbed a little bit of sales as it's gone on, as consumers don't want to be sold to. Like, People have gone, okay, I want to be marketed to them. I'm quite happy to go and read all of your content. I just don't want to talk to you. Or I want to talk to you, but I'll decide when I want to talk to you. So it's no longer in your control when you talk to the consumer, it's up to them. And so marketing is now not just the, the coloring club in the corner, you know, the people who are coloring in nice things in the corner. It's now the people who are responsible for getting all the leads for sales. They're also responsible for making sure that those sales are ready. They're responsible for part of the sales process. And then after that consumer is sold, they're also responsible for making sure that that consumer sticks around. So because consumers can just go, yeah, I'm, I'm bored of you, I'm going somewhere else. Marketing's role is to make sure that that person is like really happy with the service that they're getting. So marketing is now also fulfillment. So marketing becomes everything that we do to get and keep consumer. And so that's a big role for marketing and that changes the, the way that we approach things because that means that anything you put on your site, any sale you make, anything that you do becomes marketing. And it's impossible, completely impossible to do all of that by hand. You're going to manage all of that in spreadsheets. So you're going to get yourself into a pickle pretty much straight away. So automation becomes, if you like, there's some laughing happening at the screen. I'm sorry, my, by Hannah manager. I'm sorry, but it's my accent and I think it's happier with the Scottish accents than it is with the South African accent, bizarrely. Um, but yeah, you can just amuse yourselves there if I get particularly boring, definitely. So yeah, automation is kind of leveraging everything you need to do for marketing. So, ta-da, what does your WordPress site become? Marketing automation, yay! So everything kind of gets consumed by this, you know, conglomerate, the blob of marketing automation now. Um, and we have to start to bridge that gap and we have to do it in a way that doesn't turn people off. And so that's where bias psychology comes into it. If we can understand why the consumer is doing what the consumer is doing, and we can understand what they're actually looking for, and we can do it in such a way that doesn't make consumers defensive, we can bridge the gap between what we need as businesses and what the consumer wants to do. That's what Netflix has done in a fantastic way. If you didn't want to be interrupted, Netflix said, great. I'm going to allow you to watch a full episode of something without adverts inside it, and I'm going to allow you to watch the next episode. So Netflix has got this right. We just have to figure out how we do it properly. So I'm going to take you through a couple of things. First, I'm going to talk you to you about clickbait. No, no, I promise. I just love this title. The one trick that brains don't want you to know. Um, yeah, click, clickbait works for some very specific reasons, but it also doesn't work because we've got used to what clickbait is. So it was a new, shiny, exciting thing, and then we got used to it, and we were like, ah, it's not so exciting anymore. Um, so what does a consumer actually most rely on when it comes to make a decision? It's an audience participation. Think about it. When you make a decision as a consumer, what do you most rely on? Yes? Yeah? Friends, family, trusted recommendations? Yeah? Effort, requ effort required. Oh. Ooh. So 
here's something really, I'm, I may have set you up for failure there, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but effectively, what consumers most rely on is actually rule sets. We use all of these little bits, so information from everyone else, um, information in, in its own, like reading blog posts and stuff, and the effort that required to make that actual purchase. We use all of this and we build it into rule sets and, and schemas effectively. So what we do is we spend a lot of time making habitual choices. And that's why when you wake up in the morning, I'm terrible in the morning, I can't even make my own tea. My husband has to make tea for me to get me out of bed, otherwise it ain't happening. <laughs> I'll just be in there until it's the afternoon and then it's okay to come out. Um, so that kind of routine of doing things in the morning, that's a habitual pattern I've got myself into. But what's the first thing I do, despite the fact I can't make tea for myself, I pick up my phone and I'll go to a, a few different sites and have a look at stuff. I had to delete Reddit off of my phone because I spent so much time on Reddit that I had to be like, no, that's a bad habit to get into. And so I had to train myself out of that. And we create these rule sets in order to cope with modern life. Um, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. This is how we pay attention. There's a rad dude called Daniel Kahneman who created this um, uh, theory for how we pay attention to things. And it's kind of very inventive. He said that there are two different systems for how we pay attention to stuff, system one and system two. And that's what he called them because obviously he had plus points for creativity. And um, these two systems explain why we do things a little bit differently. So in order to pay attention, we have one system that is very fast. It's like immediate, it happens straight away. You don't actively think about it. We have a second system, which is a little bit slower. It takes, it ponders over things. Um, system one is really automatic. It happens without you thinking about it. That's when you do all your rules and, and all your habits and all that kind of stuff. When you pick up your phone without thinking about it and you're like, how did I pick my phone up and why am I on Reddit, right? That's system one controlling you. System two is the much more manual process. So when I ask you to work out what's two times or, or 52 times 12, you're gonna be like, oh, 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 that's system two, right? A lot more manual of a process. Um, and we like to like we like to refer to system one as the autopilot. We spend a lot of our day in autopilot. It does things without us having to worry about it. And system two is our pilot. And these two different systems control most of our life. Okay, that's how we pay attention to stuff. Now, the best example for these two things is everybody in the room drive or kind of know how to drive or had driving lessons. Yeah, right. Driving. <laughs> Ed's nodding because we were speaking about this last night. Um, driving lessons are like when you're learning how to drive, doesn't it feel like the most overwhelming thing on the planet? Like especially if you learn how to drive in a car with gears, you're like, wait, I have to use my feet and one of my hands and look at stuff at the same time? That's not happening, right? And so you spend a lot of time figuring out, okay, I've got to put the clutch in and then change gears. Might just be me. It took me a while to figure it all out. Um, but effectively, you figure all of that out and you're like, oh, now there's traffic. Oh, <laughs> now we've got a problem. But now you hop in your car, you switch the car on, you drive down the road and you end up at work and you're like, how did I get here? And you're driving like at least a minimum of a one ton death machine and you didn't pay attention to how you got there. It's a little bit scary, right? A little bit scary. So system one effectively took over the process. Once it learned how to do something, it took a long time for it to put rules in place. Once it learned how to do something, it was like, okay, I can do this. You don't have to think about it. I've got this. System two, in the beginning, had to figure out how everything worked and we had to pay attention to it. Now, the two main differences between these systems is the amount of information they take in. System one takes in 11 million bits of information per second. It's why you can be driving along thinking about something else and you don't crash into everything that, that's around you most of the time, right? System two only takes in 40 bits of information per second, okay? That is a significant difference between the two seconds, between the two systems. You relied and actively thought about all the decisions that you have to make during the day and you relied on that just to get out of the house in the morning, it wouldn't happen. Our brains would freeze up and we wouldn't be able to deal with it. So the only reason that system one can take in that amount of information is because it's associative. It uses rule sets and it puts things in place and it goes, okay, when I am sleepy, the first thing I think about is coffee. So when I'm tired, I need caffeine and I'll go and make a cup of tea or go and make a cup of coffee. And it creates those rule sets over time, but it took a while to get into that habit. Whereas system two is much more intensive and effortful and it's what we like to think we spend most of our day in as cognitive beings, it doesn't happen, 
right? We spend 85% of our day in system one. So most of the time we're cruising along, we're not paying attention to anything, which is terrifying. Um, I like to explain these two systems in terms of the minions. <laughs> if you haven't seen the minion movie, uh, that's your homework to go and watch just for marketing purposes, not for anything else. Um, but the minions basically, they get given some commands and some control and they're told to go do some stuff and they mess it up, man, unless it's really, really simple. So the minions, there's thousands of them, they go off and they do their things. They're controlled and created by this dude called Gru, right? Gru is like this criminal overlord and he kind of controls the minions, he created them and they do the things that he needs them to do so he can be the criminal overlord. He couldn't be it without the minions. And so what I want you to think about is every time you're creating something, remember that your consumers are more than likely in minion mode, okay? So when they're looking at your website, you've got a bunch of minions running around looking at your site. Not this dude. He ain't paying attention. He's only got 40 bits of information that he can give to you. He is hugely cognitive demand, like massive cognitive demand. He uses a huge amount of calories. The brain doesn't want to use it. The brain wants to use the minions, right? So just, just keep that in mind. And the one thing we can really rely on is that system one is going to make mistakes. Have you ever been so tired that you've done something really odd, like put the remote control in the freezer, but the ice cream on the couch? Yeah, that's system one making a mistake. It's taken some rule sets and it's switched them around. Have you ever driven, supposed to be driving to the shops and ended up at work and been like, how did I get here? That's system one making a mistake because it's, it's, it's made an association, it's gone and got in the car, and I need to go somewhere, it must be work. And because system two is so tired, it doesn't pay attention to it. So we make mistakes and, and we call these um, heuristics, the rule sets are called heuristics, um, but we call these mistakes cognitive biases as well. So there are some mistakes that your consumers will make absolutely every day because they're running around in minion mode and those cognitive biases will affect how people interact with your content. So what we wanna do as businesses is we kind of wanna focus on system two and we want that to be in the moment, but we forget about the fact that it's hugely demanding on the brain and the brain doesn't want to use system two. So we've gotta make all of our usability and everything, this like nice buzzword at the moment, we have to make all of that minion friendly. And if we can make all of our stuff minion friendly, then we're happy businesses because we'll get conversions. So we've learned through different rule sets, through the internet, we've all been to the school of search. No one's actually been to the school of search, but we've all gone through the process of, of be becoming masters in the school of search, doctorates. Um, we know that when we type things into Google and when we get to the ads at the top of the search results that we don't click on those because someone wants something from us, right? So we scroll down, we see if there's something else relevant if we don't find something else relevant, we'll go to the ads if we absolutely have to, right? So we've learned that when you click on an advert, somebody wants to sell something to you and it's not exactly a great relationship, so you go in with your front up. But we've also learned that when you see a big, flashy, exciting banner that has some odd words on it and you click on it, oh no, I have a virus, <laughs> right? We've learned that. So there are some things that we learn, but it took us a while to. So we know what we need to pay attention to because we've been to these different schools of thought, but we also know what we not what, what we shouldn't pay attention to. So here's a couple of sites that I took, a, a couple of search results that I took some screenshots for. So this is where um, the kind of, don't worry about putting, I've seen some glasses go and I'll talk through them, don't worry, I know it's tiny. Um, the way that we pay attention has really massive implications for SEO, okay? So I search for lifecycle marketing, the way of doing stuff, and I was like, okay, what comes up? Now, there are seven results out of the 10 results that came up that sound almost exactly the same. It starts with what is, right? So think about the fact that you've got minions crawling over this page. You're not paying cognitive attention to it. The minions are finding the thing that matched what you wanted to. And so even though some of these are what is customer lifecycle marketing and what is lifecycle marketing, it groups them together because that's easy. It's easy if we group the things together. So the first thing it does is it looks at this and goes, that's the same. Um, that's kind of the same, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same. What are the ones that are outliers, the complete guide to something, and product lifecycle management? Those are the two outliers on this page. The first thing it's gonna do is find the associations, and then it's gonna differentiate. So it's found the two differentiators. Do the differentiators do what I need it to do? And if they do, then great, they'll take one of those. If the differentiator doesn't, they'll go back to that association and group that it's created and gone, do I trust any of these sources? 
So Marketo is a really good trusted resource for a lot of these things. But because it's a trusted association, it's going to default to that. So you've got two ways that you can affect the way that people are actually going to engage with your content, you can differentiate yourself, or you can build a trusted rule set where people see you and they go for you first because you get flagged up, right? Um, so that's that search result. Here's a second search result that we, I wanted to give you a real life example. Here's one that we did. So this is uh, Infusionsoft, which is a piece of software, don't worry about that. Um, but I typed in Infusionsoft help and this is one of the things that we rank for on the first page. And most of it's like the help center. Then there's a couple of service related things and there's even some integration stuff. So we know the company Abundant Solutions and we know where Schaefer and then there's us there. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to differentiate ourselves, still be really clear that we're selling a service, but differentiate ourselves from the two things, right? Um, but we didn't want it to sound like we were selling at people. These two things here, immediately our services in Fusionsoft Help, what's the minions gonna do? No, it's sales, run away, right? That's the first thing that they're gonna think. So they don't go through to that site. And I know because I know these guys, that they get the clicks, but they don't get conversions from that page. Then we've got um, Wes Schaefer down here, and then we've got Hired, Hired Gun Solutions. Both of these people, um, it's, it's kind of really salesy, the information that's there. So we were like, how do we differentiate ourselves in such a way that we you know, mitigate some of the sales stuff, still be honest and truthful about who we are and what we're trying to do here, but provide the information. So we're like, right, let's see if we can show people a case study, we can show what other people are doing because that's what people are interested in and looking for infusions of help. We get really good conversions from that page. Um, and we know from talking, uh, the, the infusions of partner community is quite open, very much like this community. So we know from talking to them that they don't get good conversions from that page and we do. So we differentiated ourselves. We made sure that we were like putting trust in there and we were putting honesty in there so that people, when the minions called over that page, they were like, yeah, these, these, these guys are okay. These guys are okay, I'll go and have a look. Can we get good traffic to that page? All right, so just remember that your consumer is in minion mode. They're doing this all the time. They're not really actively paying too much attention up until the point that they really need to, and then they will pay that attention. So if you take one thing away from today, it's that your brains, brains are actively working against you. It's not a conspiracy, they just are, right? They're trying to self-preserve, and they're gonna push you out as much as possible because they don't trust you. Um, so let's have a look now at the other side of the coin. That's attention. Let's look at purchase decisions. So what goes into a purchase decision? How does someone actually decide how they're going to purchase something? Um, so there's a great bit of experimentation done by a dude called Brian Knutsford by Stanford University. And what he did is he chucked people into an fMRI scanner. And he said, I'm going to show you some pictures of products and then I'm going to show you the price. And then I want you to press a button if you're going to purchase, if you would purchase that thing with the money that you currently have now. Um, and what he did like a whole bunch of different products and stuff, but the most universal one was definitely chocolate. <laughs> so chocolates, most people like chocolates. It's a very small percentage of people that don't like it or can't eat it. Um, but for whatever reason, it's quite a universal liking, um, mostly because here's a little fun fact for you guys. When you eat chocolate, it releases the same um, hormones in your brain that get released when you take certain drugs like heroin. So, you know, you are actually having a physiological addiction response when you eat chocolate. Just say, just say, it's not, it's not that I eat too much chocolate, it's actually my brain, obviously. That's your excuse from now on. <laughs> so chocolates, when people saw the box of chocolates that they wanted, the reward centers of their brain lit up like a Christmas tree. This kind of makes sense, right? We see something and we want it. Our brain has to understand what it would be like to have that thing. So it puts us through the process of having it and then we get a reward response. Great, we get a little bit of a dopamine hit. Yay, all exciting. What was really interesting was when they saw the price. When they saw the cost of the product, the pain centers of our brain lit up. And these are literally the parts of our brain that are, are responsible for physical and emotional trauma. <laughs> okay? And that's what happens when we see the price of a product. Didn't matter how much they lowered the price, to understand price, we have to hack our brains a little bit. There is no part of our brain that evolved to kind of buy stuff. So we're using two pretty old parts of our brain and we're smooshing them together in a way to understand what's happening in the modern world. And so we say, we've got to give something away that we already own. That's a painful experience. And evolutionarily, let's say you got yourself some berries. Now you have to give your berries away to somebody else. That means you could die in winter. 
So obviously the pain response is gonna kick in. The exact same thing happens with money nowadays. It doesn't matter how much you lower the price in order for us to understand price, we have to emulate it with pain, okay? And what they managed to do is they managed to figure out the likelihood of someone purchasing something depending on the activation in these areas. So the net value of, of the product, so how much that product was worth to that consumer and how likely they are to purchase was simply the amount of reward that they got minus the amount of pain that they got. So you have to focus on getting that net value positive. So making sure that that net value is positive and as high as possible. This is what some premium brands do exceptionally well. There is no difference between the Gucci handbag and a plastic bag. Not really. If you put things in it, you carry it to somewhere, right? That's what happens. But Gucci handbag is pretty. Gucci handbag, all the marketing. I mean, I don't actually like Gucci, so I have no idea if it's pretty or not. But I've been told that it's very pretty. Gucci handbag is pretty. Gucci handbag does all these amazing rewards things because the brand has really worked on positioning itself. It's gone, we have a higher positioning. You're going to get more reward for this thing than you would for a plastic bag because it taps into how we see ourselves socially. So they've heightened the position of their brand and their brand is not mitigated by the amount of pain that it costs to spend money for their target audience. Okay, for other target audiences, they don't have the money. They don't have a lot of money. It's not floating around everywhere. They cannot spend it. It's too much pain, so they will not spend the money. You have a shopping addiction, on the other hand, you have a short circuit in that system and you are directly correlated to spending money and feeling good, so you bypass that system. But I'm assuming most of your consumers don't have shopping addictions, unfortunately. <laughs> most of the people looking at your website certainly won't as well. So every day we hack our brains to do certain things. We hack our brains to pay attention and we also hack our brains to actually buy stuff. And so you need to focus on heightening the position of your brand. How can you increase the perceived value of your brand while decreasing perceived costs without dropping your prices? Because dropping your prices doesn't necessarily correlate to more reward. If the price is too cheap, people will go, something iffy is going on there. I'm not quite sure why I don't feel good about that, but it can't be as good quality because the price is too low. So there is a price correlation relationship that you need to get right as well. So one of the easiest ways to hack this is to create really quality content. You wanna heighten the position of your brand, create really good quality content that you can have on your site that people will go, those guys know what they're talking about. That's what we wanna do, right? All right, so bridge the gap by adding value to your consumers. This is how you start to kind of create that bridge. So I'm gonna show you the life, to, the answer to life, the universe and everything. It's not 42. In fact, it's two things that I want you guys to be able to take away. And so effectively, it's framing. Frame stuff really well. That's what our brains are desperate for. So here's a couple examples of that framing. So I don't know if you've seen this example before, but this was The Economist's pricing structure on their websites. Um, so The Economist normal, the co .com subscription, web subscription is $59. The print subscription is $125. Um, if we just see $59, do we understand that? Probably not. We don't understand that we have no frame of reference. We see $125, ah. Now we can compare and contrast the two things. Then we see that the print and web is $125. Oh, that's interesting. So their conversion rates, 16% went for the 59%, 0% went for $125, and full 84% went for the print and web together because now we can contrast and we can see that that's a good deal. Um, so, you know, as you do when you're optimizing your website, we go, this is a non-converter, let's take it out. It's not doing anything, it's useless. Uh -uh, we had a problem. Economist subscription at $59 and then just at $125. 68% of people now purchase the cheaper option. It's not great for the economist, right? It's not what they want. 32% took the higher priced option. And so this is what we call coherent arbitrariness, right? Coherent arbitrariness is when you put an arbitrary baseline. The arbitrary baseline was that the print subscription is 125 pounds. So putting the two things together creates a really nice baseline. And then you have coherent behavior around that baseline. What baselines can you guys put on your site to frame things really nicely for people? Then let's have a look at these two squares, right? Which gray is darker? The one in the middle, right? Which gray is darker? They're exactly the same. 
So that's what framing does for your consumers. It allows them to go, these products are different, and this is why I should choose one over the other. If you're looking for a darker internal gray, you're going to go for that one, despite the fact that they're exactly the same. Um, then this really comes down to implicit signals and explicit signals. So implicit signals are understood by the minions. That's the frame you're creating, the positioning of your brand. And it comes in in that 11 million bits of information per second, right? Those of your implicit signals are being taken in, we create these associations, and boom, we understand what the frame is. The explicit signals, like language, are understood by this Gru dude at the top, system number two. So look at Adidas Dynamic Pulse shower gel. Why is it men's leading shower gel for quite a long time in the US? Because of this. They made their branding look suspiciously like oil. Right? High performance motor oil. It shows the same shaped bottle, roughly, the same color. They even had much closer branding, but I couldn't find the image for that one that wasn't copyrighted. They made like some little sections on the side here that were really grippy, as if the shower gel was magically going to zoom off and do something. Um, there's an audible click when you open the top of the cap, and the way that you open the top of the cap is the same way that you open the top of the oil bottle. They, everything implicitly was targeted towards, it is a high performance motoring product. It's gonna give you an energizing, exciting shower, right? But then this happened. Castor oil changed, castor oil, it's not castor oil, castor oil, <laughs> changed their branding. And Adidas went, okay, we can handle that, right? And the minions were like, yay, this works, we like this. And then you've got that with cars as well. Land Rover Defender, my favorite car. Jaguar, do the same thing. They get you from A to B. It's just the way that you get there is slightly different. But effectively, if you look at their advertising, everything about the Jaguar car is like swishy and, and like all like swishy. I can't think of any other word than swishy for this car. Um, and the road is all like zoomy and it looks like it's going fast and it looks exciting and it's got two exhaust pipes. Why does it need two? Because, because it's fast and the mountains are exciting. Everything about this car says, I go really fast and it's going to be nice when you drive me, right? Look at this car. I'm not supposed to be in water. Cars don't go in water. <laughs> That's not where cars go. It's like literally one of the first things they tell you not to do when you're driving. Don't drive into the river, right? But the Defender, you can. And everything about the car is created in such a way that it's boxy. It doesn't need to be boxy. It could be swishy and still go in rivers, but it's not. It's boxy, all the signals are screaming at you, I have a very specific purpose. The, brave, the, the framing is exceptional. Let me look at cognitive effort. This is the big thing that I want you guys to take away. Your websites are hard to use. Has anyone ever done the Stroop test? Yeah? This thing's a total, utter bastard. Hate it. Did it a lot at university. So you're supposed to read out the color, not the word. And now we have system one and system two fighting. So system one's going, I'm, I'm, I'm green, I'm green, I'm green. And system two is going, no, but it says blue. And the two things are trying to override one another. When you start this process, it's really easy in the beginning because you're like, yeah, I can pay attention. The further down you get, the harder it gets and the more mistakes you make, okay? That's what you're doing with your website when you don't make it easy. Coincidentally, if you need a Christmas present for someone who likes swearing, this is a great game and it uses the same principle and the more alcohol you drink, the more system one takes over, just by the way. So you're doomed to fail the drunker you get with this game. Just saying, not from personal experience or anything. Um, but this is an example of the Stroop test in function. So you've got to look at your site and go, is that what I'm doing? So we need to kind of hack the brain. We need to ease the cognitive demand on your websites. Make it easy and then also control the frame. So here's the questions for you guys. Go away and look at the sites that you're creating, look at your products, look at absolutely everything, and say to yourself, what am I implying on the site? The, the color choices, the language that you're using, the, the positioning of everything, the images behind it. What, what, are you, what, are the, what are the implicit signals that you're giving to people, and is it what you want? And then what about the explicit stuff? You know, What are you explicitly saying in your copy, and do the two things match? Um, are you controlling that frame? Are you saying to them, this is what I want you to think of? And are you actually controlling that properly? Or is it controlling you? And are you focusing on continually increasing your net value? So you're giving that reward and taking away some of the pain where possible. Um, and is it really cognitively demanding? Now, a great test for this, I was being asked last night by Ed, how do we actually, you know, is there a good test for that? Get your grandmother to use your site. Someone who doesn't know how to use the internet. 
if your grandma or your mom or somebody who's totally not techie can use something, you're doing a great job, it's minion friendly. They can't use it, you're in trouble, right? So understand behavior, understand how your consumers are thinking, anticipate their needs and then validate it with your data. Make tests and don't just go, okay, that's a good job and then wonder why your monetary values just like drop through the ceiling and you're missing 43% of your profits like The Economist did. Um, now, because you guys are here, you're more than welcome to get a free copy of my book, which um, I have little golden tickets for, which is on all of this stuff. You're more than happy to have it. Just come and grab a golden ticket or you can go to that URL. All right, that's me, guys. Thanks so much, Kenda. Um, so we've got time for maybe two or three questions for Kenda just now, if you just want to raise your hand. Yeah. Go on then. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Anchoring. So the £19,000 option is exactly the same as the £1,700 option. It's just that the £19,000 is being paid. So that is actually a cognitive bias called the anchoring effect. So the first price that you see sets the baseline. This is why putting cheaper price is a really bad idea. Don't do that because that sets the baseline for something. If you want somebody to choose something, put that option in the middle, anchor it with a slightly higher price and then go further and down. Does anybody take us up on our £19,000 option? No, that's not what it's there for. If they did, I'd be like, hells yeah, that's really cool. But that's not, that's not what it's there for. It's a, it's a fallacy price effectively to get people to, to realize that £1,700 is not actually that expensive. And then there's a cheaper price behind that as well. Mm. Mm. Do a double blind. Don't ever just go from one way. So go the other way as well. And then so you can say to people, um, so a double blind test is just people don't really know which option they're getting, and the person who is giving the options doesn't know which option is being given. Um, so get somebody who knows a little bit about psychology to put that together, that experiment together for you if you're gonna experiment with it. But you generally say to people, give them the higher price and then come down, but then start the other way and go up. And then also ask them to name a price and then try and, and try and get an average and aggregate between all of them. We'll give you the best option. <laughs> Um, if you've got a focus group, you'll get one every time because they're paid to be there to give you that answer. I don't like focus groups for that reason. Um, so they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, so what I like to do is I like to take a small group of customers, people who are already existing customers, and you ask them how you feel the pricing is relative to the service that they've got. Um, so rather than asking them what they'd pay, take that experience and go, is the price worth the experience or would you pay more or would you pay less? And see how they feel. But if you take a trusted group of people who are going to be honest with you, they'll give you an honest answer. Most of the time, if you're offering a really, I mean, like we've always been told by all of our customers, we need to charge more for what we do. I'm not gonna, <laughs> but that's what they say to us. And that's why we've got our pricing to where it is. Um, so if your consumers are all telling you, you need to charge more, you need to charge more because you are actually undermining that reward relationship because you're undermining it with the cost of, of the event itself or, or the product of itself. But that baseline, you're kind of saying to people it's not as valuable as if it was higher. So there is a, there is a line to toe, but I like to do it from the experience side as well. Okay. Yeah, Kendall, you'll be around for the rest of the day, I, I yes. guess. So yes. if I'm you on do. The panel tomorrow, there's a panel tomorrow. Brilliant. So if you do come up with anything afterwards, uh, Kendall will be here to, to answer I that. I love questions. Can we have another big hand for Kendall, please? <laughs> <laughs>